Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I forget, I do want to ask that uh, we have two uh, versions of this statement. It's the same statement, but we have two copies, uh, one of which has been signed and certified uh, as releasable, cleared for public release by the uh, chair of the declassification working group for the intelligence community, and each page has been initialed by that individual. And the second copy that I would also like to make uh, available and part of the record is a similar copy that was signed and certified by the representative of the Department of Justice and initialed uh, indicating that they, they agreed and concurred that it was suitable for public release uh, because, as you know, the Justice Department has some litigation concerns, ongoing cases. So I'd ask that those be made part of the record. Without objection. Okay. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today to advise the committees and the American public on the progress to date of the Joint Inquiry Staff's review of the activities of the U.S. intelligence community in connection with the September 11th terrorist attacks on the United States. As the horror and sheer inhumanity of that day engulfed this nation, all of us struggled with shock with the utter disbelief and the inevitable search for answers. The questions, if not the answers, were obvious. How could we have been so surprised? What did our government, especially our intelligence agencies, know before September 11, 2001? Why didn't they know more? What can we do to strengthen and improve the capabilities of our intelligence agencies and, as a result, help save ourselves and our children from ever having to face this again. On February 14, 2002, the leadership of these two committees announced their resolve to come together to find credible answers to those sobering but critically important questions. The committees joined in an unprecedented bicameral and bipartisan joint inquiry effort to meet that challenge. To conduct the review, the committees assembled a single staff that we call the joint inquiry staff of 24 highly skilled professionals with experience in such areas as intelligence collection, analysis, management, law enforcement, investigations, and oversight. My testimony this morning is intended to address the inquiry's initial task, which was to conduct a factual review of what the intelligence community knew or should have known prior to September 11, 2001, regarding the international terrorist threat to the United States. I caution that the inquiry remains a work in progress and that we may be developing additional relevant information as our work continues. That being said, we feel it is important to share with the American people through these hearings what we have found through our efforts to date. Let me briefly describe the way in which we have approached this review. We decided to target our search on categories of information that would most likely yield, yield any intelligence material of relevance to the September 11th attacks. Specifically, our teams requested and reviewed from the intelligence community agencies these categories of information. Any information obtained before September 11th suggesting that an attack on the United States was imminent and what was done with it. Okay. Any information obtained before September 11th that should have alerted the intelligence community to this kind of attack, that is, using airplanes to attack buildings and what was done with it. Any information obtained before September 11th about the 19 dead hijackers and what was done with it. And any information obtained after September 11th about the hijackers and their backgrounds, including their involvement with Al-Qaeda, entry into this country and activities while in this country, as well as why they never came to the attention of the United States government. And I would point out on the issue of the hijackers that we do intend, we will not address that this morning, but we do intend to have an additional statement at subsequent hearings that are focused on that issue. 
As part of its review of the evolution of the international terrorist threat against the United States, the Joint Inquiry staff produced a chronology that begins in 1982 and ends on September 11, 2001. And that chronology, I believe, has been reproduced and handed out and is also depicted on these charts uh, here in the room this morning. And I would request that the chronology also be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. The chronology notes significant events in international terrorism, significant counter-terrorist actions that were taken by the U.S. government in response to the threat, and information received by the intelligence community that was potentially relevant to the September 11th attacks. The chronology underscores several points regarding what the U.S. intelligence community knew about the international terrorist threat to the United States and U.S. interests prior to a September 11, 2001. And these are those points. September 11, while indelible in magnitude and in impact, was by no means America's first confrontation with international terrorism. While the nature of the threat has evolved and changed over time, it has long been recognized that United States interests were considered prime targets by various international terrorist groups. In response to a number of terrorist attacks on U.S. interests abroad during the 1980s, the U.S. government initiated a focused effort on terrorism, against terrorism, including the establishment by the Director of Central Intelligence, William Casey, of the Counterterrorism Center or CTC at CIA headquarters in 1986. In 1996, 10 years later, the FBI created its own counterterrorism center at FBI headquarters. Both in terms of attempts and actual attacks, there was considerable historical evidence prior to September 11th that international terrorists had planned and were in fact capable of conducting major terrorist strikes within the United States. The 1993 attack on the World Trade Center, the subsequent discovery in 1993 of plots to bomb New York City landmarks, and the arrest in 1999 during the millennium of an individual with al-Qaeda connections intending to bomb Los Angeles International Airport should have erased any doubts to the extent they existed about that point. From 1994 through as late as August 2001, the intelligence community had received information indicating that international terrorists had seriously considered the use of airplanes as a means of carrying out terrorist attacks. While this method of attack had clearly been discussed in terrorist circles, there was apparently little, if any, effort by intelligence community analysts to produce any strategic assessments of terrorists using aircraft as weapons. Osama bin Laden's role in international terrorism came to the attention of the intelligence community in the early 1990s. While bin Laden was initially viewed as a financier of terrorism, by 1996, the intelligence community was aware of his involvement in directing terrorist acts and had begun actively collecting intelligence on him. Bin Laden's own words indicated a steadily escalating threat. In August 1996, Osama bin Laden issued a public fatwa, or religious decree, authorizing attacks on Western military targets in the Arabian Peninsula. In February 1998, bin Laden issued another public fatwa, authorizing and promoting attacks on U.S. civilians and military personnel anywhere in the world. Following the August 1998 bombings of two U.S. embassies in East Africa, intelligence community leadership recognized how dangerous bin Laden's network was. In December 1998, Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet provided written guidance to his deputies at the CIA, declaring in effect a, quote, war with bin Laden. 
While counterterrorism was a resource priority from the time of the DCI's statement onward, it was competing with several other intelligence priorities, such as nonproliferation. Despite the DCI's declaration of war in 1998, there was no massive shift in budget or reassignment of personnel to counterterrorism until after September 11, 2001. By late 1998, the intelligence community had amassed a growing body of information, though general in nature and lacking specific details on time and on place, indicating that bin Laden and the al-Qaeda network intended to strike within the United States. And concern about bin Laden continued to grow over time and reached peak levels in the spring and summer of 2001 as the intelligence community faced increasing numbers of reports of imminent al-Qaeda attacks against U.S. interests. In July and August 2001, that rise in intelligence reporting began to decrease, just as three additional developments occurred in the United States. The Phoenix Memo, the detention of Zacharias Musawi, and the intelligence community's realization that two individuals with ties to bin Laden's network, Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi, were possibly in the United States. The two individuals turned out to be two of the 19 hijackers on September 11th. The intelligence community apparently had not connected these individual warning flags to each other, to the drumbeat of threat reporting that had just occurred, or to the urgency of the war effort against bin Laden. Our review to date provides further context for each of these points. And my written statement addresses in great detail each point. For purposes of this review, I'm going to focus not on the historical sections, but rather on our review of more recent intelligence reporting. And the first point uh, in that uh, regard would be intelligence reporting on bin Laden's intentions to strike inside the United States. Central to the September 11th plot was Osama bin Laden's idea of carrying out a terrorist operation within the United States. It has been suggested that prior to September 11, 2001, information available to the intelligence community had for the most part pointed to a terrorist threat against U.S. interests abroad. Our review confirmed that shortly after Osama bin Laden's May 1998 press conference, the intelligence community began to acquire intelligence information indicating that bin Laden's network intended to strike within the United States. These intelligence reports, which I'll go through in a minute, uh, should be understood in their proper context. First, they generally did not contain specific information as to where, when, and how a terrorist attack might occur. And generally, they are not corroborated by further information. Second, these reports represented a small percentage of the threat information that the intelligence community obtained during this period, most of which pointed to the possibility of attacks against U.S. interests overseas. Nonetheless, there was a modest but relatively steady stream of intelligence information indicating the possibility of terrorist ta attacks within the United States. Third, the credibility of the sources providing this information was sometimes questionable. While one could not, as a result, give too much credence to some individual reports, the totality of the information in the body of reporting clearly reiterated a consistent and critically important theme, bin Laden's intent to launch terrorist attacks inside the United States. And I will su summarize several of these reports. And, and I should stress again, these are in declassified versions. They have been declassified. In June 1998, the intelligence community obtained information from several sources 
that bin Laden was considering attacks in the United States, including Washington, D.C., and New York. This information was provided to senior U.S. government officials in July 1998. In August 1998, the intelligence community obtained information that a group of unidentified Arabs planned to fly an explosive-laden plane from a foreign country into the World Trade Center. The information was passed to the FBI and the FAA. The FAA found the plot highly unlikely given the state of that foreign country's aviation program. Moreover, they believed that a flight originating outside the United States would be detected before it reached its intended target inside the United States. The FBI's New York office took no action on the information, filing the communication in the office's bombing repository file. The intelligence community has acquired additional information since then, indicating there may be links between this group and other terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda. In September 1998, the intelligence community prepared a memorandum detailing Al-Qaeda infrastructure in the United States, including the use of fronts for terrorist activities. This information was provided to senior U.S. government officials in September 1998. In September 1998, the intelligence community obtained information that bin Laden's next operation would possibly involve flying an aircraft loaded with explosives into a U.S. airport and detonating it. This information was provided to senior U.S. government officials in late 1998. In October 1998, the intelligence community obtained information that al-Qaeda was trying to establish an operative cell within the United States. This information indicated there might be an effort underway to recruit U.S. citizen Islamists and U.S.-based expatriates from the Middle East and North Africa. In the fall of 1998, the intelligence community received information concerning a bin Laden plot involving aircraft in the New York and Washington, D.C. areas. In November 1998, the intelligence community obtained information that a bin Laden terrorist cell was attempting to recruit a group of five to seven young men from the United States to travel to the Middle East for training. This was in conjunction with planning to strike U.S. domestic targets. In November 1998, the intelligence community received information that bin Laden and senior associates had agreed to allocate reward money for the assassinations of four top intelligence agency officers. The bounty for each assassination was $9 million. The bounty was in response to the U.S. announcement of an increase in the reward money for information leading to the arrest of bin Laden. In the spring of 1999, the intelligence community obtained information about a planned bin Laden attack on a U.S. government facility in Washington, D.C. In August 1999, the intelligence community obtained information that bin Laden's organization had decided to target the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of Central Intelligence. Target was interpreted by intelligence community analysts to mean assassinate. In September 1999, the intelligence community obtained information that bin Laden and others were planning a terrorist act in the United States possibly against specific landmarks in California and New York City. The reliability of the source of this information was unknown. In late 1999, the intelligence community obtained information regarding the Bin Laden Network's possible plans to attack targets in Washington, D.C. and New York City during the New Year's Millennium celebrations. On December 14, 1999, an individual named Ahmed Rassam was arrested as he attempted to enter the United States from Canada. 
An alert U.S. Customs Service officer in Port Washington stopped Rassam and asked to search his vehicle. Chemicals and detonator materials were found in his car. Rassam's intended target was Los Angeles International Airport. In February 2000, the intelligence community obtained information that bin Laden was making plans to assassinate U.S. intelligence officials, including the director of the FBI. In March 2000, the intelligence community obtained information regarding the types of targets that operatives in bin Laden's network might strike. The Statue of Liberty was specifically mentioned, as were skyscrapers, ports, airports, and nuclear power plants. In March 2000, the intelligence community obtained information indicating bin Laden was planning attacks in specific West Coast areas, possibly involving the assassination of several public officials. The intelligence community had concerns that this information might have come from a source known to fabricate information. And in April 2001, the intelligence community obtained information from a source with terrorist connections who speculated that bin Laden would be interested in commercial pilots as potential terrorists. The source warned that the United States should not focus only on embassy bombings, that terrorists sought, quote, spectacular and traumatic, close quote, attacks, and that the first World Trade Center bombing would be the type of attack that would be appealing. The source did not mention a time frame for any attack. Because the source was offering personal speculation and not hard information, the information was not disseminated within the intelligence community. Bin Laden's declaration of war in 1998 and intelligence reports indicating possible terrorist plots inside the United States did not go unnoticed by the intelligence community, which in turn advised senior officials in the U.S. government of the senior serious nature of the threat. The staff has also reviewed documents other than individual intelligence reports that demonstrate that at least at senior levels, the intelligence community understood that bin Laden posed a serious threat to the domestic United States. Here are five examples. A December 1st, 1998 intelligence community assessment of Osama bin Laden read in part, and I quote, UBL is actively planning against U.S. targets. Multiple reports indicate UBL is keenly interested in striking the U.S. on its own soil. Al-Qaeda is recruiting operatives for attacks in the U.S., but has not yet identified potential targets. On December 4, 1998, in a memorandum to his deputies at the CIA, the Director of Central Intelligence summed up the situation in this way, quote, We must now enter a new phase in our effort against bin Laden. Our work to date has been remarkable and in some instances heroic. Yet each day we all acknowledge that retaliation is inevitable and that its scope may be far larger than we have previously experienced. We are at war. I want no resources or people spared in this effort, either inside CIA or the community. A classified document signed by a senior U.S. government official in December 1998 read in part, quote, the intelligence community has strong indications that bin Laden intends to conduct or sponsor attacks inside the United States. In June 1999 testimony before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and in a July 1999 briefing to House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence staffers, the chief of the CTC described reports that bin Laden and his associates were planning attacks in the United States. And a classified document signed by a senior U.S. government official in July 1999 characterized bin Laden's February 1998 statement as, quote, a de facto declaration of war, close quote, on the United States. 
What is less clear is the extent to which other parts of the government, as well as the American people, understood and fully appreciated the gravity and the immediacy of the threat. For example, officials at the National Security Agency, whom we have interviewed, were aware of DCI Tenant's December 1998 declaration that the intelligence community was at war with bin Laden. On the other hand, relatively few of the FBI agents interviewed by the Joint Inquiry staff seem to have been aware of DCI Tenant's declaration. There was also considerable variation in the degree to which FBI-led Joint Terrorism Task Forces, or JTTFs, prioritized and coordinated field efforts targeting bin Laden and al-Qaeda. While the FBI's New York office was the lead office in the vast majority of counterterrorism investigations concerning bin Laden, many other FBI offices around the country were unaware of the magnitude of the threat. There are also indications that the allocation of intelligence community resources after the DCI's December 1998 declaration did not adequately reflect a true war effort against bin Laden. In 1999, the CTC had only three analysts assigned full-time to bin Laden's terrorist network worldwide. After 2000, but before September 11, 2001, that number had risen to five. On a broader scale, our review has found little evidence prior to September 11 of a sustained national effort to mobilize public awareness and to harden the homeland against a potential assault by bin Laden within the United States, with the possible exception of a heightened focus on weapons of mass destruction. The second point that I want to cover is strategic warning indications of a possible terrorist attack in the spring and summer of 2001. Let me briefly describe what we have found regarding the level and the nature of threat information that was obtained by the intelligence community during the spring and summer of 2001. During that time period, the community experienced a significant rise in information indicating that bin Laden and al-Qaeda intended to strike against United States interest in the very near future. Some individuals within the community have suggested that the increase in threat reporting was unprecedented, at least in terms of their own experience. While the reporting repeatedly predicted dire consequences for Americans, it did not provide actionable detail on when, where, and how specific attacks would occur. Between late March and September 2001, the intelligence community detected numerous indicators of an impending terrorist attack, some of which pointed specifically to the United States as a possible target. In March 2001, an intelligence source claimed a group of bin Laden operatives were planning to conduct an unspecified attack in the United States in April 2001. One of the operatives allegedly resided within the United States. In April 2001, the intelligence community obtained information that unspecified terrorist operatives in California and New York State were planning a terrorist attack in those states for April. Between May and July, the National Security Agency reported at least 33 communications indicating a possible imminent terrorist attack. None of these reports provided any specific information on where, when, or how an attack might occur nor was it clear that any of the individuals involved in these intercepted communications had any first-hand knowledge of where, when, or how an attack might occur. If they did know, it was not evident in the intercepts. These reports were widely disseminated within the intelligence community. In May 2001, 
the intelligence community obtained information that supporters of bin Laden were reportedly planning to infiltrate the United States via Canada in order to carry out a terrorist operation using high explosives. The report mentioned an attack within the United States, though it did not say where in the U.S. or when or how an attack might occur. In July 2001, this information was shared with the FBI, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. Customs Service, and the State Department, and was included in a closely held intelligence report for senior government officials in August 2001. In May 2001, the Department of Defense acquired and shared with other elements of the intelligence community information indicating that seven individuals associated with bin Laden had departed various locations for Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In June 2001, the DCI's CTC had information that key operatives in Osama bin Laden's organization were disappearing while others were preparing for martyrdom. In July 2001, the DCI's CTC was aware of an individual who had recently been in Afghanistan who had reported, quote, everyone is talking about an impending attack, close quote. The intelligence community was also aware that bin Laden had stepped up his propaganda efforts in the preceding months. On August 16, 2001, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the INS detained Zacharias Musawi. Prior to that date, in August 2001, Mr. Musawi's conduct had aroused suspicions about why he was learning to fly large commercial aircraft and had prompted the flight school he was attending in Minneapolis to contact the local FBI office. FBI agents believed that Musawi may have been intending to carry out a terrorist act. On August 23, 2001, the intelligence community requested that two individuals, Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi, who had first come to the attention of the community in 1999 as possible associates of bin Laden's terrorist network, be added to the U.S. Department of State's watch list for denying visas to individuals attempting to enter the United States. Working levels of INS and U.S. Customs had determined that at least one of them was likely in the United States prompting FBI headquarters to request searches for them in both New York and Los Angeles. The FBI's New York field office unsuccessfully searched for Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi. The FBI's Los Angeles office received the search request on September 11, 2001. In late summer 2001, the intelligence community obtained information that an individual associated with Al-Qaeda was considering mounting terrorist operations within the United States. There was no information available as to the timing of possible attacks or the alleged targets. And on September 10, 2001, NSA intercepted two communications between individuals abroad suggesting imminent terrorist activity. These communications were not translated into English and disseminated until September 12, 2001. These intercepts did not provide any indication of where or what activities might occur. occur. Despite these indicators of a possible terrorist attack inside the United States, during the course of interviews, the Joint Inquiry staff was told that it was the general view of the U.S. intelligence community in the spring and summer of 2001 that an attack on U.S. interests was more likely to occur overseas. Individuals in the intelligence community pointed to intelligence information, the arrests of suspected terrorists in the Middle East and Europe, and a credible report of a plan to attack a U.S. embassy in the Middle East as factors that shaped their thinking about where an attack was likely to occur, occur. One senior FBI official said that based on the intelligence he was seeing, he thought there was a high probability, quote, 98 percent, close quote, that the attack would occur overseas. 
During the summer of 2001, the intelligence community was also disseminating information through appropriate channels to senior U.S. government officials about possible terrorist attacks. For example, in June 2001, the community issued a terrorist threat advisory warning U.S. government agencies that there was a high probability of an imminent terrorist attack against U.S. interests by Sunni extremists associated with bin Laden's al-Qaeda organization. The advisory mentioned the Arabian Peninsula, Israel, and Italy as possible locations. According to the advisory, the community continued to believe that Sunni extremists associated with al-Qaeda are most likely to attempt spectacular attacks resulting in numerous casualties. Subsequently, intelligence information provided to senior U.S. government leaders indicated that bin Laden's organization expected near-term attacks to have dramatic consequences on governments or cause major casualties. A briefing prepared for senior government officials at the beginning of July 2001 contained the following language. Quote, based on a review of all source reporting over the last five months, we believe that UBL will launch a significant terrorist attack against U.S. and or Israeli interests in the coming weeks. The attack will be spectacular and designed to inflict mass casualties against U.S. facilities or interests. Attack preparations have been made. Attack will occur with little or no warning. Later, intelligence information provided to senior government leaders indicated that bin Laden's organization continued to expect imminent attacks on U.S. interests. The Joint Inquiry staff has been advised by a representative of the intelligence community that about a month later, in August 2001, a closely held intelligence report for senior government officials included information that bin Laden had wanted to conduct attacks in the United States since 1997. The information included discussion of the arrest of Ahmed Rassan in December 1999 and the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. It mentioned that members of al-Qaeda, including some U.S. citizens, had resided or traveled in or traveled to the United States for years and that the group apparently maintained a support structure here. The report cited uncorroborated information obtained in 1998 that bin Laden wanted to hijack airplanes to gain the release of U.S.-held extremists. FBI judgments about patterns of activity consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks and the number of bin Laden-related investigations underway as well as information acquired in May 2001 that indicated a group of bin Laden supporters was planning attacks in the United States with explosives. In August 2001, based on information it had in its possession at the time, the CIA sent a message to the FAA asking the FAA to advise corporate security directors of U.S. air carriers of the following information. Quote, a group of six Pakistanis currently based in Bolivia may be planning to conduct a hijacking or possibly a bombing or an act of sabotage against a commercial airliner. While we have no details of the carrier, the date, or the location of this or these possibly planned actions, we have learned that the group has had discussions in which Canada, England, Malaysia, Cuba, South Africa, Mexico, Atlanta, New York, Madrid, Moscow, and Dubai have come up, and India and Islamabad have been described as possible travel destinations. Close quote. While this information was not related to an attack planned by al-Qaeda, it did alert the aviation community to the possibility that a hijacking plot might occur in the U.S. shortly before the September 11th attacks occurred. Now I want to turn to intelligence information on possible terrorist use of airplanes as weapons. Central to the September 11th attacks was the terrorist use of airplanes as weapons. 
In the aftermath of the attacks, there was much discussion about the extent to which our government was or could have been aware of the threat of terrorist attacks of this type and the extent to which adequate, adequate precautions were taken to address the threat. Based on our review to date, we believe that the intelligence community was aware of the potential for this type of terrorist attack but did not produce any specific assessments of the likelihood that terrorists would use airplanes as weapons. Our review has uncovered several examples of intelligence reporting on the possible use of airplanes as weapons in terrorist operations. In December 1994, Algerian armed Islamic group terrorists hijacked an Air France flight in Algiers and threatened to crash it into the Eiffel Tower. French authorities deceived the terrorists into thinking the plane did not have enough fuel to reach Paris and diverted it. A French anti-terrorist force stormed the plane and killed all four terrorists. In January 1995, a Philippine National Police raid turned up materials in a Manila apartment indicating that three individuals planned, among other things, to crash a plane into CIA headquarters. The Philippine National Police said that the same group was responsible for the bombing of a Philippine airliner on December 12, 1994. Information on the threat was passed to the FAA, which briefed U.S. and major foreign carriers. In January 1996, the intelligence community obtained information concerning a planned suicide attack by individuals associated with Sheikh Omar Abd al-Rahman and a key al-Qaeda operative. The plan was to fly to the United States from Afghanistan and attack the White House. In October 1996, the intelligence community obtained information regarding an Iranian plot to hijack a Japanese plane over Israel and crash it into Tel Aviv. An individual would board the plane in the Far East. During the flight, he would commandeer the aircraft, order it to fly over Tel Aviv, and then crash the plane into the city. In 1997, one of the units at FBI headquarters became concerned about the possibility of a terrorist group using an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, for terrorist attacks. The FBI and CIA became aware of reporting that this group had purchased a UAV. At the time, the agency's view was that the only reason that this group would need a UAV would be for either reconnaissance or attack. There was more concern about the possibility of an attack outside the United States, for example, by flying the UAV into a U.S. Embassy or a visiting U.S. delegation. As noted previously, in August 98, the intelligence community obtained information that a group of unidentified Arabs planned to fly an explosive-laden plane from a foreign country into the World Trade Center. Also noted previously in September 98, the intelligence community obtained information that bin Laden's next operation could possibly involve flying an aircraft loaded with explosives into a U.S. airport and detonating it. In November 1998, the community obtained information that a Turkish Islamic extremist group had planned a suicide attack to coincide with celebrations marking the death of Ataturk. The conspirators who were arrested planned to crash an airplane pa packed with explosives into Ataturk's tomb during a government ceremony. The Turkish press said the group had cooperated with Osama bin Laden. The FBI's New York office included this incident in one of its Osama bin Laden databases. In February 1999, the intelligence community obtained information that Iraq had formed a suicide pilot unit that, planned to use, that, that it planned to use against British and U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf. The CIA commented that this was highly unlikely and probably disinformation. In March 1999, the intelligence community obtained information regarding a plan by an al-Qaeda member who was a U.S. citizen to fly a hang glider into the Egyptian presidential palace and then detonate the explosives he was carrying. The individual who received hang glider training in the United States 
brought the hang glider back to Afghanistan. In April 2000, the intelligence community obtained information regarding an alleged bin Laden plot to hijack a 747. The source, who was a walk-in to the FBI's Newark office, claimed that he had been to a training camp in Pakistan where he learned hijacking techniques and received arms training. He also stated that he was supposed to meet five to six other individuals in the United States who would also participate in the plot. They were instructed to use all necessary force to take over the plane because there would be pilots among the hijacking team. The plan was to fly the plane to Afghanistan and if they could not make it there, that they were to blow up the plane. Although the individual passed an FBI polygraph, the FBI was never able to verify any aspect of his story or identify his contacts in the United States. And in August 2001, the intelligence community obtained information regarding a plot to either bomb the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi from an airplane or crash an airplane into it. The intelligence community learned that two people who were reportedly acting on instructions from bin Laden met in October 2000 to discuss this plot. Despite these reports, the community did not produce any specific assessments of the likelihood that terrorists would use airplanes as weapons. This may have been driven in part by resource issues in the area of intelligence analysis. Prior to September 11, 2001, the CTC had 40 analysts to analyze terrorism issues worldwide, with only one of the five branches focused on terrorist tactics. Prior to September 11, 2001, the only terrorist tactic on which the CTC performed strategic analysis was the possible use of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons because there were more obvious potential for mass casualties. At the FBI prior to September 11, 2001, support for ongoing investigations and operations was favored in terms of resources over long-term strategic analysis. We were told during the course of our FBI interviews that prevention occurred in the operational units, not through strategic analysis and that prior to September 11, the FBI had insufficient resources to do both. We were also told that the FBI's Al-Qaeda-related analytic expertise had been, quote, gutted, close quote, by transfers to operational units, and that as a result, the FBI's analytic unit had only one individual working on Al-Qaeda at the time of the September 11 attacks. While focused strategic analysis was lacking, the subject of aviation-related terrorism was included in some broader terrorist threat assessments, such as the National Intelligent Estimates on Terrorism. For example, the 1995 NIE on Terrorism cited the consideration the Bozinka conspirators gave to attacking CIA headquarters with an aircraft. The document contained the following language. Our review of the evidence suggests that conspir the conspirators were guided in their selection of the method and venue of attack by carefully studying security procedures in place in the region. If terrorists operating in this country, the United States, are similarly methodical, they will identify serious vulnerabilities in the security system for domestic flights. The 1997 update to that report on terrorism included the following language. Civil aviation remains a particularly attractive target in light of the fear and publicity the downing of an airliner would evoke and the revelations last summer of the U.S. Airport, air transport sector's vulnerabilities. In a December 2000 report, the FBI and the FAA published a classified assessment that suggested less concern about the threat to domestic aviation. Quote, FBI investigations confirm domestic and international terrorist groups operating within the United States, but do not suggest evidence of plans to target domestic civil aviation. 
terrorist activity within the U.S. has focused primarily on fundraising, recruiting new members, and disseminating propaganda. While international terrorists have conducted attacks on U.S. soil, these acts represent anomalies in their traditional targeting, which focuses on U.S. interests overseas. After September 11, 2001, the CIA belatedly acknowledged some of the information that was available and had been available regarding the use of airplanes as weapons. A draft analysis dated November 19, 2001, entitled The September 11 Attacks, A Preliminary Assessment, states, we do not know the process by which bin Laden and his lieutenants decided to hijack planes with the, with the idea of flying them into buildings in the United States. But the idea of hijacking planes for suicide attacks had long been current in jihadist circles. For example, GIA terrorists from Algeria had planned to crash an Air France jet into the Eiffel Tower in December 1994 and Ramzi Youssef, a participant in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, planned to explode 12 U.S. jet airliners jetliners in mid-air over the Pacific in the mid-1990s. Likewise, the World Trade Center had long been a target of terrorist bombers. Despite the intelligence available in recent years, our review to date has found no indications that prior to September 11, analysts in the intelligence community were cataloging information regarding the use of airplanes as weapons as a terrorist tactic, sending requirements to collectors to look for additional information on this threat, or considering the likelihood that Osama bin Laden, al-Qaeda, or any other terrorist group would attack the United States or U.S. interests in these ways, in this way. Mr. Chairman, our purpose this morning was to report on the information that the intelligence community possessed prior to September 11, 2001, about terrorist attacks of the kind America witnessed on that fateful day. In closing, let me just say that for all of us who have been conducting this review, the task has been and continues to be not only a daunting one, but in all respects a sobering one. We are ever mindful that lost lives and shattered families were the catalyst for this inquiry. We know, as I have heard Ms. Pelosi say many times, that we are on sacred ground. We also have come to know from our review of the intelligence reporting the depth and the intensity of the enemy's hatred for this country and the relentless zeal with which it targeted American lives. We understand not only the importance but also the enormity of the task facing the intelligence community. As my statement this morning suggests, the community made mistakes prior to September 11th, and the problems that led to those mistakes need to be addressed and they need to be fixed. On the other hand, the vengeance and the inhumanity that we saw on that day were not mistakes for Osama bin Laden and for others like him. The responsibility for September 11th remains squarely on the shoulders of the terrorists who planned and participated in the attacks. Their fervor and their cruelty may be incomprehensible, but it is real. It persists and it is directed at Americans. We are convinced that it is no longer a question of whether the intelligence community can do better. It must do better. America can afford no less. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement this morning. Thank you. Ms. Hill, I would like to extend uh, my congratulations to you and the staff uh, for an excellent, uh, sobering, assessment uh, of the events uh, prior to September the 11th.